Well, good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's webinar. Today's talk is entitled Applying Sound Research Practices in Development of Medical Devices. My name is Andrew Jordan and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Now today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. And this webinar is designed to be interactive. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now this chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. And if you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using that chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. And please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future download. And a big thanks to Premier Research who developed the content for this webinar. Premier Research is a leading clinical development service working with highly innovative biotech, specialty, pharmaceutical, and medical device companies. The company has a wealth of experience in medical device and diagnostics research, having managed over 200 projects in the last five years alone. Its services include clinical research and regulatory outsourcing in the areas of analgesia, hematology and oncology, medical devices, neuroscience, pediatrics, rare disease. They operate in 84 countries, employ more than 1,000 clinical professionals, and Premier Research has a strong international network of clinical monitors and project management professionals combined with regulatory, data management, statistical, scientific, and medical experts and staff as its well-established network of dedicated clinical sites. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Nikki Dodsworth is currently Vice President Quality Assurance and Risk Compliance for Premier Research with responsibility for pharmaceutical and medical device studies. Now Nikki is an active member of the European Forum for Good Clinical Practice or EFGCP. In 2011 she was appointed Chair of the Education Working Party and is a member of the Audit Working Party. Nikki's conducted widespread training for various groups and is presented in 14 different countries. During 2010, she started to run the recently accredited EMWA workshop on quality awareness in CSR development. She is a senior associate member of the Royal Society of Medicine and in 2009, Nikki became a chartered scientist. Nikki has worked closely with the Institute of Clinical Research since 1996 and is currently co-chair of the GCP Forum and she works closely with the Ethics Forum. And in two, July of 2011, uh, Nikki became a member of the Research Quality Assurance West and Wales Organizing Group which promotes information exchange at a regional level. And joining us for the Q&A session will be Joanne Emmett. She's been part of the clinical research industry for more than 20 years with a keen focus on operational design and delivery. Ms. Emmett started her career in academia within transplant research and proceeded on to cardiovascular research involving valve and imaging trials. Once joining the CRO business space in 1995, she was engaged as a CRA, LCRA, and project manager working on trials in CNS, oncology, respiratory, cardiovascular device, and several diagnostic programs. Ms. Emmett took her frontline delivery experience to the next level and moved into oversight and department leadership specializing in clinical and project management delivery, spending time at PRA and joining Premier Research in early 2011. And now it's with my pleasure to hand the microphone and the presentation over to, you, to your first speaker for today, and that's Nikki Dodsworth. Nikki. Hello, and thank you again for joining this webinar. Today, there's even greater demand to show safety and performance of a medical device by running specially designed clinical investigations. 
There is pressure from regulators before they grant market approvals. Uh, payers are requiring, requiring more information to substantiate product value claims and approve reimbursement. Healthcare systems and doctors are asking more when making purchasing decisions, and even patients are wanting greater transparency. These pressures are forcing manufacturers of medical devices to gather more clinical data, and this means running more clinical investigations. The trend is actually also increasing, even when not mandated by certain applications, such as the 510K, for example. So device manufacturers are starting to run more clinical trials to differentiate their products from the competitors and improve the chances of an earlier adoption. Due to the nature of the medical device industry, many sponsors don't always have this internal resource or expertise to run a complete clinical investigation, especially some of the more virtual types of organizations. So what is important is to consider early that the investigation must be designed to verify the performance characteristics defined by the manufacturer of the device under normal conditions to determine any undesirable side effects under normal conditions uh, of use and to allow an informed assessment to be made uh, to see if this is acceptable when weighed against the benefits in relation to the intended performance of the device. So this presentation is not aimed at looking at in detail in the regulations, I, I will of course just touch on these, but rather we will consider the best practices to be followed or good clinical practice if you like particularly as defined in ISO 14155 2011. So today we're going to be looking at the following. We're going to take a look at the, some of the key principles, the regulatory landscape in, in the US versus Europe. Uh, I'll take an outline look at the ethical considerations and getting it right from the start, which is always good. Uh, informed consent, obviously we can't talk about research without talking about informed consent looking at the ongoing conduct of an investigation, the quality management system and its importance, and then at the very end of a study, what do we do, and conclude with some take-home messages. Firstly, let's take a look at what's important. This is the backbone of running a medical device study when we are considering sound research practices. ISO 14155, 2011 which is called Clinical Investigation of Medical Devices for Human subject, Subjects, Good Clinical Practice. There are great similarities in this ISO when compared to the pharma equivalent of ICHGCP. But the great thing about the ISO is that it's been an international standard only since 2011, whereas ICHGCP has been around for a long time, since 1996-97 time, and as such has become a little dated. Um, of course, as we know, there are current updates uh, in, with Revision 2 that are due out shortly. However, ISO 14155 has been adopted almost globally as a way of running device trials and is very good at defining good research standards. The principles set forth in ISO also, comply, uh, also apply to investigations for non-regulatory purposes. In this case, the requirements for this international standard should be followed as far as possible. For post-marketing surveillance studies, there are less requirements and also reduced monitoring activities, but these are not really going to focus on today. However, it is highly recommended to follow the ISO requirements, as more and more notified bodies are putting importance on these studies, and so are the regulatory authorities. And uh, you may have all noticed recently that there was a warning letter uh, which just shows this. So do check national regulations. Um, there will be some op optional requirements, um, but some of these may be obligatory in some countries. And also additional documents may be required for initial submission, depending on national requirement or the, de the design of the study. The key principles of running any research program must always be based on protecting the rights, safety, and well-being of human subjects, conducting a good risk-benefit analysis, and ensuring ethical reviews and approvals. We will take a closer look on, on what this means a little later. Finally, and really essentially, the trial needs to be conducted to good scientific principles to ensure valid data and credible results. Otherwise, the project will not be a success. I'm just going to quickly outline the regulatory landscape in the US versus Europe when we're looking at running a clinical investigation. 
I've only listed uh, GCP or good clinical practice aspects here, not touching on any of the GMP side of things when we're running medical device investigations. So if we look at the US, um, we have the FDA requirements, the 21 CFR Part 11, which is electronic records and signatures, Part 50, which is protection of human subjects, 54, which is financial disclosure, 56 covers IRBs, and then of course we've got 21 CFR Part 812 on international investigational device exemptions, and 21 CFR Part 814, which is on the pre-market approval. Although ISO, and this one's in brackets, I put in brackets here, although the ISO is universally recognized, it doesn't actually form part of the official FDA regulatory requirements. The FDA, however, do recognize the principles it represents and that it can serve as a useful global standard for medical device, good clinical practice. Of course, global recognition and conformity to this standard will help promote and harmonize GCP and ensure reliability and integrity of the data submitted to support any marketing applications, while ensuring that human research subjects are protected. In Europe, we follow the relevant medical device directives, um, which is currently 9342 EC and 9385 EC uh, for implantable medical devices. We have the med devs as well, and there's a whole list of them on the slide there, which I'm not going to go through in any detail. Also, um, we, there, there are other ISOs out there, which is, for example, the ISO 14971, uh, which is application of risk management. We have global harmonization task force documents as well, which can be used, um, as well as other ISOs, for example, ISO 13485 on quality management systems. What we're going to focus on in more detail is, are the aspects related to the ISO 15155, as this is a very practical application in running device investigations. Um, of course, we are expecting uh, an update um, in the EU on the medical device legislation shortly with the new medical device regulation, but that is a whole topic in itself for another day. Also remember in Europe, we do follow member state requirements, um, the Declaration of Helsinki, uh, as well. Now I think it's time for your first um, polling question for the audience, so I will hand over momentarily to Andrew. Perfect, thank you Nikki, and that polling question is appearing on audience members' screens, and you can vote on this in real time uh, by clicking on one of the answers there. The question we have for you, uh, for those of you planning to initiate future clinical trials, where are you in the submission process? Maybe that's six months from submission, one year from submission, two years or greater, or maybe that's not applicable to your position right now. Uh, for those of you planning to initiate future clinical trials, where are you in the submission process? Looks like most of you have voted on this, so thanks for uh, voting. We'll be closing polling shortly here and sharing the results with the audience. There we have it, 52% of you not applicable to you right now, 17% of you say six months from submission, another 17% saying a year from submission, 13% saying two years or greater. And with that, Nikki, I'll hand the mic back to you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so now let's take a look at the ethical aspects to consider when running medical device trials. Studies need to be designed in such a way to allow ethics committee members to understand the purpose of the study, um, if the study will be worthwhile, the, the risks, the burdens, the benefits to the subject, um, if the subjects will be recruited fairly, if there's going to be adequate information provided, uh, and obviously clearly there's going to be no coercion, um, if information on subjects will be handled appropriately, and also if there will be fair redress if a subject is harmed in any way. You also need to consider methods of recruitment, the processes for informed consent, data protection, ethics approvals and any updates that you need to make, payments to subjects, investigators, incentives, conflicts of interest, and finally insurance and indemnity. You also need to consider special populations such as subjects who lack capacity, um, for example in emergency situations or paediatric populations or, or subjects who have no alternative treatments available to them. 
these groups have added ethical dilemmas and there needs to be greater consideration to ensure these subjects are protected. And also consider if the subjects taking part will have any direct benefit. Ethical review is not required for a proof of concept study, providing that assignment of patients to a particular therapeutic strategy or diagnostic procedure is not decided in advance by a protocol or a SIP, but falls within current clinical practice. Uh, also, that the decision to use the product is clearly separated from the decision to include the patients in the study, and there are no diagnostic or monitoring procedures undertaken other than those ordinarily applied in clinical practice. Just to briefly mention the Declaration of Helsinki here, this has been quite a controversial document over the years, but it is referenced in the ISO 14155 for medical device trials. Um, as the latest version, which is currently the 2013 version. Uh, of course, there are differences between the pharma side of the industry and the medical device side. We are using an older version in the pharma side. Subjects need to be provided with site contact details as well in case of, a, of an emergency, or if they just wish to discuss an aspect of their condition or the trial with the investigator. And ISO states that the principal investigator must provide trial subjects with a subject card if relevant. Clinical investigations are only allowed to be conducted on vulnerable subpopulations when there is, it's impossible to actually run these in non-vulnerable patients. And the ISO does provide quite a lot of information on emergency treatments. And of course, before you start a study, you need to have a favorable opinion from your ethics committee in order to start it. Often what happens is the principal investigator makes these applications, uh, but sponsor representatives can, can also help and help do this in a, a timely manner. When evaluating uh, a, a study design to determine whether the design will support approval, an important consideration is the statistical concept of bias. In a clinical study, bias may lead to an incorrect determination of safety and effectiveness. Study designs that introduce little or no bias are preferable to designs that do not control for bias, which can be introduced into clinical studies due to a number of reasons. Designing studies to collect the right data is more important than designing studies simply to collect more data. Bias can, of course, distort the interpretation of study outcomes. And consideration of the potential for study bias is a critical factor in designing a study to reduce the risk that bias may invalidate the final study results. A second general consideration when evaluating a study design for level of evidence is the sampling variability, which is controlled by the sample size of the study. On the one hand, a larger sample size provides more data so that estimates of performance uh, and less sampling variability, of course, and hence the study becomes more precise, but on the other hand, larger sample size can result in an analysis for a clinically insignificant outcome that demonstrates it is statistically significant. So studies need to be designed to show both clinical and statistical significance. It's also important to note that an increased sample size will not necessarily address the issues of bias. Sites from which subjects or samples are chosen for studies that support the intended use of the device should be representative of the types of sites where the device is intended to be used. Subjects or samples should be represented from the proposed target population. Estimates of overall performance from non-representative sites or subjects may suffer from selection bias. The actual method of selecting subjects or samples for a study must be specified in the study SIP. So subjects enrolled in the study should represent the target condition spectrum. When the subjects enrolled do not match the target condition spectrum, estimates of diagnostic clinical performance are subject to a spectrum effect. For example, if only subjects from the extreme ends of the target condition are sampled, either a healthy normal subject or subjects with advanced stage disease, then performance can appear to be better than it truly is. This is because subjects in the middle of the target of the condition spectrum are omitted and they tend to be more difficult to diagnose correctly. 
Sometimes the target population includes subjects with a rare condition such that recruiting subjects with a rare condition can be difficult and expensive. Designs that over-represent the rare condition in the subject population compared to the proportion in the target population might sometimes be appropriate. However, estimates of overall performance for such a design may have the potential for bias, so this potential bias should be considered in the statistical analysis plan. So it is really important to find the right sites with the correct populations, consider their previous experience, check any available information that may be available, for example, clinicaltrials.gov, and make sure there are no competing studies which could delay your investigation. It is really important to get an investigation right from the start. First patient, first visit. This is um, often a metric used, um, but it's not a good quality metric. Um, what is important is to follow, is to allow sufficient time to write a good clinical investigational plan or SIP, to have detailed informed consent documents written which can be clearly understood by patients. According to ISO, the SIP must be approved, signed and complied with by the principal investigator. It, so any changes to the SIP need to have implementation plans in place. Um, consider how you will notify all relevant staff of the changes, um, how will they be retrained, for example. Also, a formal approval may be required from a regulatory or ethics uh, committee to allow for these changes. And these, of course, need to be in place prior to allowing these changes to take effect. In the ISO 14155, Annex A actually gives you some very detailed requirements on the SIP format and content, which is quite useful. Also make sure you have relevant insurance and indemnification in place. Compensation is as per national regulations, and this needs to be documented as well. Allow plenty of time for obtaining regulatory, ethics, and other local national approvals. Generally, these take at least three months. For ethics committees, as per the ISO, it states if national or regional ethics committee requirements are less strict than this ISO, then the sponsor shall apply the more stringent. The ISO does certainly define the minimum documents to be submitted to the ethics committee, but this of course needs to vary according to national and regional requirements. Typically the minimum documents to be submitted to an ethics committee is the SIP, the investigator brochure, the informed consent, any advertising. Uh, that you may have um, and the CV of the principal investigator. But other documents such as the case report form and any other data collection tools, some information on the subjects, the investigator, institution, payment compensation, etc., or as well as um, potential conflicts of interest and insurance certificates may also be required. Start thinking about the generating the um, study plans early as well. You will need project plans in place before any patients are recruited. These can include things like monitoring plans, safety plans, data management plans, etc. Um, and these types of documents are written to complement the SIP, which is often deficient in these areas. Of course, there are also certain documents which need to be translated. This is usually defined in local national laws as well as sponsor SOPs. Typically, the SIP is translated as well as documents which need to be given to patients. These types of documents must be also be back translated to ensure the translations are correct. Uh, these again take time and expertise, so consider this process early. A data monitoring committee or a DMC should be established at the start of a clinical investigation. And this is also detailed in the ISO. I just wanted to slot in this slide um, just to look at some special considerations for medical devices as per the FDA. When we look at how the device works, there should be an understanding of the scientific principles underlying the device function and the mechanism of action in assessing performance and the adequacy of the proposed study design. This information is especially important as part of the pre-submission. Uh, in which a sponsor requests FDA's advice in developing their investigations. Some devices require considerable training and skill to use in a safe and effective manner. 
this clearly would apply to implantable devices requiring the user to be highly trained surgical specialists, for example, uh, particularly when the procedures involved could be complex. Sometimes multiple personnel and skill sets are needed for appropriate use of the device as well. For example, one person may um, have a certain skill set to collect the specimen, another person with a different skill may process the specimen, and still yet another person with a third skill set may interpret the results. So when designing a, a device study, one should consider all these skills necessary for the safe and effective use of the device. The skill sets of the study investigators and the personnel should reflect the range of skills of personnel likely to use the device in the intended use setting after marketing approval. So the training provided to study investigators and personnel in the appropriate use of the device should guide the training that will be provided to users when the device is marketed. If no training will be provided for a marketed device, study personnel should not be specifically trained in the use of the device in order to ensure that the study reflects intended use conditions. We also need to consider the learning curve and human factors. Some devices are so novel that there is a learning curve associated with use of the device. Um, it may take time to master the steps prior to using the device in the clinical study. Um, this may include, for example, things like surgical techniques specific to the implantation procedure. For some devices, determination of a learning curve can be addressed during the exploratory stages, including any pilot studies. And if hands-on training of device operators is provided by a sponsor in the pre-market pivotal study, then you, one would expect such training to be provided in the post-marketing setting as well. And of course, devices with steep learning curves may not be suitable for some settings, for example, home use, uh, because they may not be safe or effective in that setting. When a learning curve is evident during the pivotal study, it's important to consider how information gathered during this learning curve period are going to be considered in the SIP that you're writing for running your clinical study. Now, I think it's time, Andrew, for the second polling question. So over to you again. Thank you. It certainly is. And that polling question is appearing on audience members' screens now and you again can vote on this in real time by clicking on any of the options. How comfortable is your company in regards to knowledge and navigation of regulator regulating authorities and the regulations themselves? Your options here, very knowledgeable, somewhat knowledgeable, not very knowledgeable or not applicable. Uh, how comfortable is your company in regards to knowledge and navigation of the regulatory regulating authorities and the regulations themselves? Looks like most of you, again, have voted on this. Thank you for doing so. We'll be closing polling out and sharing the results with everyone. 55% of you say very knowledgeable. 34% say somewhat knowledgeable. 9% of you saying not very knowledgeable. And just 2% saying not applicable. And with that, Nikki, I'll hand the mic back to you. Thanks, Andrew. So we're going to go back to getting it right from the start. So selection of investigators is a sponsor responsibility. Selecting good sites is fundamental to running a good investigation. Investigators must be chosen who are adequately experienced or to be able to be trained to be adequately experienced, uh, which can be obviously more of a challenge when the device is more innovative. They need to, to know the ISO, or good clinical practice, be adequately trained on the SIP, the investigator brochure, and really, most importantly for medical device studies, the techniques to be used when handling the device or the operating procedures. So site selection is a vital step, not only looking at qualifications and expertise, but also considering availability of key site staff or, or equipment and facilities and location of laboratories. It's the responsibility of the principal investigator under ISO 14155 to ensure that he or she has the required number of eligible subjects needed within the agreed recruitment period as well. Also, does the site really see the patients you are looking for? Will other sites also need to be involved? These are all points that need to be considered and planned for. If a sponsor transfers responsibilities to a CRO or another vendor, they still have a responsibility for everything that is contracted. So not only is it important to have the correct levels of oversight during an investigation, 
it's even more important to select and assess the vendor before you start. Make sure written agreements are in place and carefully defined with realistic expectations. And there needs to be agreements in place with investigators, CROs and other suppliers as appropriate. The process of escalation and resolution of trial related issues needs to be thought out in advance as well and well documented, maybe looking at a communication plan or, or a similar document. What are the roles and responsibilities of all concerned? What level of issue needs to be escalated and to whom? And in what time frame? Just remember that the sponsor is ultimately responsible for the project execution and the outcomes and needs to remain fully involved. So informed consent documents need to be written so the patient clearly understands what is expected from them during an investigation, as well as providing the patient with the risks and any benefits they may obtain to inform them about any possible side effects, etc. The process at the study site, who will consent the patient, as well as the timing of the consent, needs to be carefully considered. Ideally, patients need time to consider if they wish to take part, except obviously in an emergency situation. They may need to discuss this with their family and friends. So consent times should be added to patients' notes, hospital notes that is, as this is important to show that no study-related procedures have been conducted prior to the patient consenting. It can sometimes be difficult to determine what is standard care and what is a study procedure. And also the role of the authorised representative also needs to be considered and the process for involving them at the right time. The consent process is a time for patients to consider the risks involved and if they are willing to accept them. For the device studies, it's particularly important to consider the residual risks at the end of the study. After all, the device may remain with them for some time. The PI is responsible in keeping patients informed about any new information that arises during the clinical investigation. And if you want a useful informed consent checklist, do take a look at sections 4.7.4 and 4.7.5 of the ISO 14155. That can be really helpful. Also consider things like conflicts of interest, payment and incentives, and they need to be part of the informed consent process as well. Of course, the legal requirement is, is more regulated in some countries, like in the US, for example, with conflict of interest. But this really does need to be considered, even when there is no formal requirement to do so. If there are any conflicts of interest, these need to be declared and carefully just documented. The regulators are more likely to inspect site that, sites that do have a conflict of interest. The ISO states clearly that the sponsor shall not have improper influence, inducement on the subject, the monitor, any investigators or any other parties. So there is actually a fine line of oversight which a sponsor must demonstrate versus too much involvement in a device trial. So let's just quickly look at some questions we could ask. Um, we could ask, for example, if when we're looking at a site, is there a high staff turnover? Are there enough resources to conduct the trial? Can the principal investigator provide a dedicated study coordinator? Will the site staff be available to meet training needs throughout the whole study? Of course, if you're looking at a teaching institution, will the resident physicians be rotated on and off the trial, or will they remain on it throughout? And are your sites experienced enough to provide the expertise that is required? So when we're looking at ongoing conduct, all the subjects must be recruited that fully meet the protocol inclusion exclusion criteria. Deviations from the protocol or the SIP, such as visit windows, commonly occur and just need to be documented as these are likely to have little impact. But this does need to be considered on a case by case basis. However, any patient who does not meet the inclusion or exclusion criteria must not be recruited. And if there are any deviations to the eligibility criteria, these may also need to be reported to ethics committees and possibly regulatory authorities. So eligibility criteria are not just a guide, they're an absolute standard to define the study population and to ensure patient state safety. 
a well-written SIP will ensure the criteria are relevant and not excessive. Patient engagement is particularly important um, as typically patients have a longer follow-up period when we're comparing them to pharma studies. So make the visits easy and the demands on the patient's time as little as possible but still encourage feedback on any safety issues should they arise during this time period. Lots of care and attention must be spent on device release, packaging, shipment, storage and accountability. The whole process needs to be fully documented, consider any temperature controls that are required to be, to be in place, will start site staff be at site um, when these are delivered, who are going to check them and where are they going to be kept. Also, if the devices are self-administered in a patient's home, how will they be stored, tracked, and disposed of if, if that's what you need to do with them? And this is often a more challenging side of things. It is important to remember that training is not a one-off event. Teams change and training needs to be continuous. Some studies run for several months or years and retraining of all staff may be required. Training on the device is very important as well as trying to standardize the operating technique. How will this be documented and conducted? Deri device risk assessment closely follows the ISO 14971 and there needs to be a summary of the risk analysis as well as any residual risks defined in the investigator brochure. So IBs therefore need to be well written before the start of the study and kept up to date throughout. The sponsor is responsible to update the IB annually and the requirements are well defined in ISO 14155. But do remember if the investigator brochure is not going to be updated, this also needs to be documented and the results of this review submitted to relevant um, ethics or competent authorities. The trial master file and the essential documents must be readily available for audit and inspection. And these documents must be attributable, legible, contemporaneous, original and accurate and often we use the acronym ALCOA. Obviously these documents also need to be complete so really what we're looking at is ALCOAC. Key documents require a formal sign-off but do also consider how other staff document their reviews of these documents if they're not part of the formal sign-off process. And version controls and dates are also very important to track the study process and order of events. And also remember that some documents need to remain at the study site and do not come in-house. Documents need to be stored in pre-arranged locations and sponsors need to have knowledge of the storage facility, the vendor, if it's used, going to be used and have good oversight of this process. Archiving requirements need to be well defined in site vendor contracts. There is obviously now an increasing use of e-documents, but these need to be validated and when archived, you need to consider how they will be read in the future. Safety reporting for medical device trials is often an area where there may be a breach of data protection. Confidential data found in a safety report or any of the associated follow-up notes may contain confidential information such as the patient's full name, date of birth or, or home address. So do make sure that study sites are well trained at the start of a study to ensure they know how to handle confidential data and how this needs to be redacted prior to forwarding to the sponsor or to an off, another off-site organisation. CRFs need to be signed once completed by the principal investigator or their authorised designee to show agreement and oversight. A sponsor cannot have exclusive control of study data on their servers, so a copy must always be kept at the study start site. Monitoring is the responsibility of the sponsor, and the ISO states that the PI must support the monitor or auditor and be accessible to answer questions during monitoring visits or at time of audits. Of course, the level of monitoring can vary, and this can take a risk-based approach or, or even remote um, auditing as long as it's well documented and justified. Monitoring plans are required um, as well and these can also document escalation pathways and any triggers required to increase monitoring. Any copies of source documents or printouts of documents must be signed and dated by a member of the site. 
Um, and a statement is also required to certify that copies are a true representative of the originals as per the ISO. And clinical records need to be marked to show a subject is involved in a, in a clinical operation, clinical investigation, sorry. Ongoing assessment of site facilities and equipment can often be overlooked. You may have made your initial assessments, but things can change. So how are you going to document this um, and your ongoing review? This is usually performed by the monitor and documented in the monitoring visit reports. You, you need to make sure the monitor understands what they're looking at and to what degree, uh, for example, all equipment and facilities need to continue to be fit for purpose, validated, calibrated, as required. And obtaining access to some of these types of documents can be a challenge. Also consider things like laboratories or other specialised services that may be specific to your investigation. The sponsor is responsible for ongoing safety evaluation of the clinical investigation and relevant reporting. And so is the principal investigator. And this must be appropriate and timely. Safety reporting is also well defined in the ISO. Electronic data systems used in data management require written procedures, verification, validation, audit trials, trails, um, controlled access, security, and backup systems. And staff need to be suitably trained, of course, to use them as well. I'm just going to really briefly touch on the quality management system. Um, it, this could be a whole presentation in itself. Um, a sponsor is responsible for having a good quality management system in place, even if they outsource many aspects of a clinical investigation. They are also responsible for verifying the existence of, as well as adherence to, written procedures at any external organisation they may use. The QMS of a sponsor is very important to ensure data quality throughout uh, an investigation. So, so what is a quality management system? And I've only just listed a, a few things on this slide here. Um, I have only really covered more the GCP aspects, if you like, rather than the GMP aspects. So I put things here, for example, like policies, SAPs, written instructions, QC activities, QA, audits, CAPAs, complaints, non-conformances, etc. But all these lead to the contribute to the final deliverable of data quality, which is so important. So at the end of a clinical investigation, we need to consider site suspension or termination and closure processes, which are also well defined in ISO 14155. In case of early termination or suspension, justification must be documented all parties must be promptly informed, and this could be ethics committees, competent authorities, other investigational sites, and, and patients as well. An analysis of the situation needs to be performed by the sponsor, and they have to take the appropriate corrective actions. If um, a clinical investigation is to resume, this must be approved, or at least concurrence is required from the ethics committee, and in some cases, competent authorities. If the study is definitively stopped, then routine closeout processes should be followed. If a sponsor stops a trial, they can report this to the ethics committee themselves rather than the investigator, which is, which is the usual route. For end of routine investigation notifications, ISO provides a really good summary of the order of notification, including the disposition of investigational devices. At the end of a trial, a study report is required as well to document the outcome as well as any deviations and non-conformances that may have occurred during the course of the investigation. Um, in the ISO, this is part of Annex D and it, it gives a really good summary on um, what is required as part of the, this report. And also document retention is defined well in the ISO in Annex E. Um, of course, this is partly as per local regulatory requirements in each country where the clinical investigation is being conducted. The principal investigator is responsible for keeping all um, clinical uh, related records for the minimum required period. You also need to consider if the principal investigator leaves the site, what may happen to these documents? 
uh, will there be another contact at the site that you can call if you need to access these documents in, in a hurry, for example? So to conclude, um, some take-home messages maybe. Um, sponsor responsibilities, I think, have undoubtedly increased with the requirement to run more clinical investigations um, with areas such as informed consent, risk assessment, monitoring, document control, and electronic data management have become better defined with greater requirements. The ISO 14155 2011 is a really good document um, as it introduces more on project management, uh, on a, a focus on project management for running clinical investigations, um, more uh, approach to good clinical practice. Um, cl it clearly defines monitoring, has a greater focus on good documentation practices, better adverse event definition for clearer understanding of reporting. It has an implied requirement for a quality management system. It's not the document that really covers that. But it also has a states an obligation to use the ISO 14971 for risk analysis. It clearly defines things, for example, like the content of a uh, SIP, uh, investigator brochures, etc., and requirements for data monitoring committees, electronic data systems, um, and procedures for suspension or premature, premature termination of a trial, as well as an extensive list of documents required for running an investigation, which is quite a lot, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and finally, um, we need to remember that the sponsor remains ultimately responsible for the conduct of the investigation. So good luck with all your trials. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Nikki. Uh, very, very informative, I think, for the audience. Uh, and at this point, I would like to invite our audience to continue sending their questions and comments in right now using that questions window. For this, of course, is the Q&A portion of the webinar. I'd also like to welcome Joanne Emmett to our conversation for this. Uh, so let's get started with our first question. Uh, how do we determine SOPs to be used for our trial? Well, thanks, Andrew, and uh, thanks, Nikki, for that great presentation. <clears throat> I just want to say it up front, uh, very informative. And uh, one of the things to consider is when you ponder back and re-listen to this webinar is some of the, the key points and certainly the guidelines, um, the ISO expectations, everything's very well detailed of what you need to do. Uh, we have this question obviously asked today. We've had it asked many times as we work with our, our sponsors on our studies. And we will go through a process or what your vendor, regardless if it's Premier, but obviously Premier Research would do this as well. We go through a process with you to work through what SOPs and um, items you may have that qualify under the QMS um, system and the ISOs requirements, thinking about the countries that you're working in or plan to work within, what your needs may be. And we would look at um, the realm of, of SOPs and processes required to run a good st a study under the good cl clinical practice hypotheses for device. Uh, we do do that. Um, we're very uh, keen on that because our processes are obviously all written to the ISO standard. Uh, we make rec we would work with you during your contract period, obviously, to make recommendations on where we see something within a gap analysis, as, as an example, to be sure that we're setting everything forward in the right uh, pathway and um, spectator view that we'd want in a well-written CIP. So hopefully, Andrew, that answered that question. Oh, absolutely. Thank you and for I can that. Supply, I can supply some more written answer following this um, as well. Perfect. I think that'd be helpful. Thanks, Joanne, for that. Uh, let's move on to our second question here. Uh, uh, this audience member is writing, we will not be ready for our study until mid-2017. Uh, when should we think about preparing our required SOPs? Well, okay, that's a good question because they should be thinking about it now uh, as they're, they're planning for everything uh, and uh, uh, creating their, their portfolio needs. So they should be planning for that now. A um, lot of activity happening if they're thinking about a st uh, their first study running in, in mid-2017, but part of that planning stage is obviously how the best practices by which they're going to operate that um, study. So I would advise that um, uh, 
question or the, the requester of that uh, question to start thinking about it now, planning for that, uh, looking internally to the, the, the staff you may have within your organization. Some of the, I know we have some larger companies on the line. We've got some smaller companies on the line. I would, want, I would really advise strongly that you think about your ability um, to take pause and, and consider this. Uh, consider if you have the expertise internally, then then great. You can tick your boxes. If you don't, you um, ponder what type of outsourcing needs you may need within that area. Um, don't hesitate to to request a gap analysis. Um, you can, as as Nikki spoke about, as you're transferring obligations, you can look at your vendors through your vendor list. Who are you going to be? What particular needs within the the um, program you're considering? Uh, what groups you may need to outsource to vendors, could be a variety of vendors, uh, could be one vendor, um, but make sure that you do that in a way and request that question. Ask where you may need to lean on the process of a vendor you're outsourcing to, which is acceptable, but there's a process related to ensuring that it's in agreement and most importantly in compliance with many of the and all of the um, regulations and ISO requirements that Nikki outlined. So a detailed step one you must make, and I highly advise to the to um, the, the the person asking the question. Be sure that you're you're considering the the size and depth of your company and where your goals are for the end result um, of the plan you've got forth. All right, uh, thank you mm -hmm. for that again, Joanne. Uh, let's move on to another question here. Uh, can we submit to the authorities in E regions without a final protocol? Oh, that's another very good question. Uh, highly advise, I think both Nikki and I would recommend you have that finalized. It's part of your, your CIP, your, your investigative plan. It's to, in the best interest to be sure that you've ticked all those boxes in advance. It's the best way to plan for the investigative sites you're going to be uh, considering working with and looking at do they have all of the applicable requirements to run your uh, device study. I would would suspect your, and I know that your timelines to review will be much more fluent if you have all of your materials fully developed and you will have potentially less questions if you've gone through the rigors of the requirements related uh, to the full uh, defined protocol. That doesn't mean that there may be uh, adjustments and amendments made to your protocol correctly so ba based on what we see happening within the deployment of the life cycle of your study in the field or in the investigative uh, and patient um, uh, aspect, but going in with your protocol considered as final state for the initial plan is highly advisable, um, high, well received by the authorities and, and IRBs that will need to be reviewing this, and planning for things like your budgetary requirements for the investigative sites. What's, what is it going to cost those centers? What will you need to be uh, considering for the cost of, of uh, procurement of the site contracts, there's a lot of, of add-on and fold-on effects that are uh, required and necessary to make sure your plan is as robust as possible in the beginning. And as Nikki had mentioned, it all starts in the beginning. So things can derail um, quickly and unfortunately if we don't have uh, near to final or final um, key documents related to the planning and execu execution of the startup. I've seen many times in my career uh, derailments of timelines, um, a lot of, as Nikki mentioned, a lot of customers worry about the first patient in, is that the right metric to consider? Uh, what has perhaps delayed that? Has it been because uh, a pressure or, or forethought was put forward on starting up in a more more pieced environment. Um, our recommendation is always to be as complete as possible and and uh, ready to go as possible. All right, well, sounds like a lot Thanks. to consider there. Thank you again, Joanne. <laughs> uh, moving to another question here as we're approaching the top of the hour. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have a QMS. Is this something that can be outsourced? Well, that's, that's interesting. As, as Nikki mentioned, it's required to have a quality management system, which is all part of your overreaching. Um, it kind of goes right into the vein, Andrew, of some of the questions I've just been answering. So your, your quality management system is your overarching approach and obligation to deliver per the consideration, application, and development of processes and 
and um, strategies that will get you to your end product, but all done within the, the guidance and application of the regulations, ISO, and all the applicable uh, requirements within countries. So it, it, it can be outsourced to something you need to be very, very careful and thoughtful about, and it's something we certainly have experience with as a company. Uh, highly thoughtful, m necessary, important, and, and most definitely can be uh, worked with with a, with a vendor and be sure you pick the right vendor to help you uh, tick the boxes that the uh, regulatory authorities and our competent authorities require of us. Sorry, Andrew, I was trying to answer that quickly so we can get to the top of the hour. That, that's great, thank you. Let's try to squeeze in one more question here. Uh, this audience member writes, DMC, we are not sure at what point uh, are we required to determine the need. Uh, so your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, the the DMC data management uh, committee, very important depending on your statistical plan, uh, something Nikki talked about and touched upon uh, earlier in her presentation. Uh, you need to pull that forward if you're not clear. Uh, pull that forward very quickly. If you don't have the expertise in-house, be sure you reach out to a vendor, uh, your CRO, um, and work with their statistical team and their uh, data management team on that very key question because you cannot, you, you cannot and should not go forward without understanding uh, the value and the timing and the uh, where you write that within your uh, protocol and within your clinical, uh, your SIP, your CIP. Sorry, rush that answer, Andrew. No, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Joanne. We have reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. Uh, but if you do have any further questions, you can direct them to the email address showing on your screen right now. That's info at premier-research.com. And if we weren't able to attend to your questions today, the team at Premier Research will try to follow up with you after the webinar. And thank you, everyone for participating in today's conference, you'll be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. And a survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it'll help us improve our further webinars. Now I just sent you a link in your chat box. You can say thanks to our speakers via Twitter, so I encourage you to do so. Thank you very much, Joanne Emmett and Nikki Dodsworth. We hope that you found this conference informative today. Have a great day, everyone.